Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast that delivers cutting-edge food as medicine solutions for optimal health. Allie Miller is a nutrition expert sought up by the media and America's top medical institutes for her revolutionary functional medicine interventions. From disease treatment to prevention, every episode will empower you with ways to put yourself back in control of your health. Please note, the topics discussed are for educational purposes only. Now welcome, Integrative Dietitians Allie Miller and her co-host Becky Yu. Welcome back to the Naturally Nourished Podcast. You are joining us for episode 138 with guest Dr. Emily Gutierrez, and we are talking about autism, ADHD, and functional pediatrics. Yes, this is going to be a really, really good one. And Allie, do you want to share a little bit about how you know Dr. Gutierrez and how you came to know about her practice? Yeah, so this is Stella's functional pediatrician. (laughs) When we moved to Austin, I always scoured the internet by uh, use of the Institute of Functional Medicine, ifm.org. There is a section called Find a Practitioner, a great place to start when you're looking for someone that has scientifically evidence-based practice that is up to date using functional medicine. And Dr. Gutierrez was on there with high regards. I went to her website, Neuro Nutrition, loved the name already and um, her approach, and it was a great fit. So Stella's only seen her twice. We don't have a super strong rapport because luckily uh, Stella hasn't had any significant illness or uh, developmental concerns or anything. So we just see her once annually, say hello. And she's so awesome. Great rapport, great bedside manner, and um, spends an entire hour with you in an initial consultation. And I just really felt at ease that she was an expert in her field. So I'm excited to bring her on to educate all of you. Yes, so I will read her bio and then we'll get into it. Dr. Gutierrez received her doctorate from Johns Hopkins University with a focus in translational medicine and integrative health. She's a certified practitioner through the Institute of Functional Medicine, IFM. Dr. Gutierrez received her master's degree in nursing from the University of Texas at Austin and is board certified as a pediatric nurse practitioner and mental health specialist. Dr. Gutierrez co-owns and operates one of the first pediatric functional medicine practices in the United States, Nutrition Associates. Recently, she wrote a best-selling book, The Parent's Roadmap to Autism, a Functional Medicine Approach that helps parents navigate how functional medicine can facilitate healing to children on the autism spectrum. Welcome, Dr. Gutierrez. So great to have you on the Naturally Nourished podcast today. Before we dive in, I want you to tell listeners a little bit about what got you into functional medicine and how you came to work in pediatrics. Well, I'm traditionally trained as a pediatric nurse practitioner. So when I went into practice, I joined a group here in Austin, Texas that um, basically we treated pediatric, you know, primary care. So I was seeing around 30 patients a day, um, sometimes, you know, a little bit less, And we were doing everything from well checks to ear infections to strep throat, you name it. It was a very busy office. And because we're in Austin, you know, the motto of our city is let's keep it weird. And, you know, the patient population that I was serving didn't like to do things, everything strictly allopathic. And what that means is if somebody came in sick, say with a virus or a fever, They wanted to know, okay, instead of antivirals, instead of steroids or medications, what else could I do for my kid that was non-pharmaceutical? And with my training from the University of Texas at Austin, basically we had no other tools in the toolbox other than, you know, pharmaceuticals. So when I started to study um, my doctorate and I went to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, basically, my, doctor, my doctorate is actually a degree of translation, which means what is current in the evidence to how do we practice in medicine? And, you know, I had to focus on a specific problem. And my problem was I loved my patients and I wanted to provide care for them, but I didn't know how to provide the type of care that they were asking for, nor did I know, is it evidence-based? Is it safe? Is it effective? 
So during that time, I really started to focus on, you know, more of an integrative approach, which, which meant, you know, instead of using um, topical steroids for eczema, you know, maybe you would use some homeopathic remedies, um, things that were outside of the box of just traditional pharmaceuticals. And anybody that really understands integrative medicine, so different tools to treat disease, whether it be, you know, nutraceuticals or mind-body practices, etc. cetera, um, once you really start to understand and, and dive into integrative medicine, it will lead you down the path to functional medicine. And yes. that's, where, that's where I began, is really trying to serve my population in a way that was meaningful for both of us. I love that your patients essentially drove the process and and that speaks so much to a healer and the power of a healer that doesn't allow ego get in the way that that you know coming in from fresh out of the books <laughs> obviously up to speed up to date with the most clinical information in an allopathic scope but being humbled by the request and and thinking that maybe there's layers of, of deeper or maybe there's more of addressing the why instead of just the what and it, it sounds like that's really gotten you where you are today with neuronutrition. Uh, let's define what your practice, that, where you came up with the name neuronutrition, and um, a little bit about your practice. Yeah, well, so I never actually intended to go out and start a practice on my own. Um, when I was giving some research dissemination, so really um, showing about my research that I did in my doctoral work, I uh, had a pediatric neurologist that really heavily recruited me and he wanted to, you know, start this big multi-center that, that treated um, neurodevelopmental things um, such as ADHD and learning disabilities and autism. And, you know, he wanted to create this kind of center that was diagnosis and treatment and, and all of that. And it was a great idea and we had a lot of fun that first year. Um, but the center, you know, didn't work out for various reasons. And I ended up having a, a pretty good population at that point of people that I was treating. So the focus really, instead of just broad pediatrics, more became focused on more neurodevelopmental issues. Um, and hence, that's why the genesis of our name is Neuronutrition Associates. Um, we really treat all things functional medicine. It's, it's kind of a narrow name now. If I, go, I could go back five years ago and rebrand it, I would. Um, but it's, it's really what has um, been the specialty focus of our practice is kids on the spectrum, uh, kids with ADHD, kids that are having problems with dysgraphia and dyslexia, um, kids with mood disorders, bipolar, depression, anxiety, OCD. So that's kind of where our name came from. And now we see everything from, you know, we have a little bit of primary care in our office. Um, we, we don't, you know, advertise for primary care, but a lot of times when you come and see us, if a patient doesn't want to go back to their medical home, we allow them to stay on for primary care. Um, but we just, you know, we treat everything pediatric chronic disease. I love yeah. it. And I love the name. <laughs> I was going to say, or the granola moms like yep. me, the, yep. the keep Austin weird moms like me seek you out for uh, primary care anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, so Dr. Gutierrez, tell us a little bit more about your work specific to autism and how your approach differs from the conventional approach and, and even to the extent of uh, the diagnostic criteria that you're using. Are you using a different diagnostic tool altogether or how does it work at the assessment level? And then um, how are you treating the individual? You know, diagnosing autism for someone that treats a lot of autism really isn't very difficult. I mean, typically within five minutes of seeing a child, I can tell pretty much where they are developmentally, especially the more severe kids. Uh, diagnosis, you know, should come from their pediatrician really making sure they're hitting milestones. Are they sitting up on time? Are they crawling on time? Are they walking on time? Or do they have words? You know, especially if there's any type of developmental regression, that's a big red flag. So 
diagnosis typically comes before they come into our door. Um, we do have some families that are seeing some delays that maybe have been dismissed by their primary care um, or their primary care says, you know, let's just wait and watch. But we know that the earlier the intervention for a child that is delayed, uh, the better the outcome. So the, the sooner and younger somebody is in my door, the better outcomes typically that we see. So diagnosis can happen you know, through a developmental pediatrician, a pediatric neurologist, or a pediatric psychiatrist for basically insurance purposes only that if you need specific therapies like applied behavioral analysis or ABA therapy. But otherwise, you know, when a child is not reaching their milestones, when they're not looking you in the eye, when they have these rhythmic, uh, like these um, behaviors that are very rigid um, and, you know, their flexibility has gone down, uh, they're not able to socially engage, they're not able to um, really integrate with the child that was within their age range, you know, there's a very large spectrum of what you can call, call autism these days. So, you know, the first thing is, is really trying to identify where is the child and whether they're severe or they have, you know, just a few delays. To me, they're still delayed, so we still start at the same place. Um, there are some things that look like autism that really aren't autism, and I think that that's an important thing for everyone that treats an autistic child to rule out. Like, for instance, having a chromosomal microarray or a big genetic workup looking at, you know, is it a chromosomal structure, a, a rare disease via the chromosomes that look like autistic behaviors, um, but it's really not autism. So I think that that should be uh, ruled out in every child. And also, you know, the comorbidity for seizures in a kid on the spectrum is very high. So we want to make sure that the delay isn't due to, you know, an organic pathology within the brain, like someone's having seizures or, you know, there's something else that might be going on. So autism can be thrown around a lot too. And I think that, you know, it's a very devastating thing for a lot of families when they get the diagnosis. So we need to be very mindful and clear going into giving the diagnosis that yes, this is in particular autism and there these other things, you know, are not contributing to the phenotypic or the physical expression of the development of the child. So advanced genetic profiles and SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms are, are one area of investigation that you would go into deeper with the, the parents and the child in a, in a pretty early onset? Uh, or are there other labs that you prioritize as additional interventions? Well, and I'm so glad that you brought up the word SNP because this is the thing. This is, to, this is my perspective of where we are in genetics today. You know, we've known about, you know, that we've had 23 sets of chromosomes for a really long time. You know, the geneticists today only, you know, treat kind of that big workup where you're looking at chromosomal structure and very limited genes that might have a single nucleotide polymorphism or a little SNP, which means that, you know, the gene has a different code to it. Um, the bigger kind of picture stuff, the chromosomal microarray is like, is like this. So you're, say you're building a house and the foundation of the house is really your chromosomes. The, the framing on the house is your chromosomes. You know, we wanna make sure that all of the framing and the foundation look good. When you're looking at different genes, it's like building the brick and the mortar and the walls. So, you know, we can take out a brick to a house and look at it and say, oh, well, there's a little chip on this brick. So is this contributing to the pathology of the developmental delay? What the truth is, is all of us have SNPs. Every single one of us have right. multiple, multiple SNPs. So it is, is that SNP significant for that child? Is it, you know, is it working in isolation, which we know it's not? And then more importantly, how is that DNA SNP really, really being transcribed through RNA to change a protein function within the body? So what's that transcriptomics of that SNP? So the big geneticists are looking at the big picture things that we've known for a long time. 
practitioners like Allie and myself, what we're looking at is, you know, what, what are the bricks look like? What are those, you know, um, subtleties that are more common in the population, but can they be contributing in a very significant way, you know, to things that are nutritional or things that are toxic in your environment, et cetera. So there's this dissension in our medical community because the geneticists aren't looking at the SNPs that we're looking at um, necessarily. So I think that both are important, but especially that big picture one, the chromosomal microarray. I think every kid with a neurodevelopmental delay needs to have one. Awesome. So now you mentioned ADHD is another kind of area of expertise of yours. And I'm just curious if it, you know, it seems like diagnosis is on the rise and drug therapy and use of stimulants is not always effective or is causing undesired side effects like weight loss and irritability. Um, Do you feel that ADHD is being overly diagnosed? And what are some of your concerns with the current treatment? You know, Becky, I do not think that they're being, it's being overly diagnosed. A, a kind of a pet peeve of mine is, though, is when a two or early three-year-old um, has a lot of attention deficit um, behaviors. That's actually very developmentally appropriate at that age. <laughs> sure. Um, so, <laughs> but unfortunately, you know, there are some stimulant drugs that are indicated for a three-year-old. And I don't want to shame anybody out there if their child is on a stimulant because I truly believe that parents do the best that they can with the knowledge that they have and are presented. But, you know, it is concerning that everybody just goes directly to a medication, which in functional medicine, you know, that's just treating the symptom without looking, okay, well, what is the source for this? And I believe that ADHD is on the rise and it is just because of the toxicity of our environment and the nutritional, you know, dearth that our children are eating, you know, they're not eating live real foods. They're eating packaged processed, chemically laden foods. Um, and that's information for their bodies. So it's interesting. They, they actually put ADHD now on the very high end of the autism spectrum. Did you know that? Mm Mm-hmm. I, I didn't. I didn't. You did, Becky? <laughs> My mom uh, is in her, she's got her nose in the DSM like every day. She's a, a school social worker. So I hear about all the new <laughs> yes. um, criteria and diagnoses and all the things we were actually jiving about this episode last night. So she'll be oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I, I always, Dr. Gutierrez, I think, and we'll talk food in a moment, but my biggest initial intervention is like you mentioned with the packaged, uh, products uh, is really harnessing the blood sugar train for children Mm -hmm. because if they are going from these high blood sugar spikes to blood sugar crashes, I mean, even as adults, we've all experienced hanger, (laughs) the Uh hungry, angry, angry, irritable uh, lows of hypoglycemia. And I find that carb control as the most immediate, you know, we can get layered, we can layer gluten and dairy removal, we can layer all these things. But the first thing is regulate their carbohydrate consumption, pair carbs with protein and fat, and balance their blood sugar levels. I think before you take to the next level, whether ADHD is a concern or is it blood sugar jags and drops? Do you you agree with that? Oh, I think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing that you just said. Absolutely. You know, I mean, hangry is a thing for sure. (laughs) It. You know, you, when you run blood work on a child, you can see that their, you know, their fasting insulin is high or their fasting mm-hmm. insulin is low. So you can vacillate between um, highs and lows. And, and how do we balance that out? I mean, we feed them real food, not just, you know, packaged food uh, that isn't alive. <laughs> so I think yeah. that's, that's great. That is, that's foundation. It's, it's number one. I mean, I cannot stress enough how important that what you put in your mouth, those pounds and pounds of food every day have a really significant impact on everything about your health and well-being and development for your child. Absolutely. So before we move on to, to maybe digging into complex treatment uh, with patients and what rocks I think you like to call them as far as like root causes or things to dig under, to to dig, to look for the root cause. Before we go that deep, just to kind of transition out of autism and ADHD, do you have for listeners like two or three turnkey interventions um, that are like the most dynamic 
influencers. So for instance, with autism, is there like one compound that you find to make the most dynamic influence on a child as a, a supplement um, beyond just like the generalized lifestyle and op occupational therapy and, and that type of work? Sure. You know, I mean, there are definite themes in autism. That's why it was, you know, great to put into the book that we just wrote, uh, The Parents' Roadmap to Autism. It just covers the big kind of nuggets and themes of where you can see dysfunction. And we see these themes over and over again. In the current model of allopathic medicine, when you get a diagnosis of autism or ADHD, basically it's psychotherapy or specific therapies for autism like ADHD, or excuse me, applied behavioral analysis, ABA therapy. And then we have our drugs. We have our antipsychotic drugs. We have our stimulant drugs. So the, the allopathic paradigm is extremely limited and, you know, Becky, you were right. There's lots of side effects that can come with some of those medications, you know, irritability, insomnia, anorexia, um, not nervosa, but anorexia where you just don't feel like eating. So, you know, they're, they're limited. They work for some people for a period of time. So I don't think there's shame in anyone listening that is, you know, helping control the symptoms with them. But when you start to take a, a big picture look at the source, you know, a lot of times you can wean down or wean off those medications completely. So, you know, with autism, I say that it's, it's important to start in the gut. And, you know, the, one of the biggest themes is some of these kids have, you know, allergies to some of the top big three foods, which is gluten, dairy, and soy. So tightening up kind of their diet and getting them off of really a lot of different sugars and processed carbohydrates because another thing a kid on the spectrum often is suffering with is something called uh, clostridia overgrowth and yeast overgrowth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are two pathogens. Clostridia is a bacterial pathogen and um, candida or a fungi a yeast that can be um, pathogenic to your microbiome or your gut as well. So if I were to choose one supplement for a child on the spectrum related to their gut, I would say, you know, doing some Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a beneficial yeast probiotic. Um, higher doses of that has been known to actually help with both of those uh, pathogens. I love that. And that's one that we use in clinic following a candida cleanse, but especially for a kiddo who, you know, might be too young to do some of the more, um, herbal compounds or um, things focused on eradication of yeast or might not be compliant with taking like 10 different supplements a day or something like that, starting with um, Saccharomyces boulardii, I think could be really, really helpful. Um, and then we'll talk in a little bit about lab testing. I know you run stool tests and kind of down that line of things as well, correct? Yes, we do. I mean, it's biomarkers. We're taught in medicine, you know, to go into a patient room and you have 10 minutes. So really the physical assessment, especially in pediatrics, I don't think as much in adult medicine, but definitely in pediatrics, it's, you know, what does the throat look like? What do the lymph nodes feel like? You know, what are the bowel sounds? How does the heart sound? What do the lungs sound like? You do this really quick physical exam. And from the physical exam, you make your assessment and, their, and then diagnosis. So when you have a chronic condition, it's not that easy. Yes, sometimes you can see outward symptoms such as, you know, eczema or a little perianal rash where you have a red, red ring around the anus. Um, you know, behaviorally, absolutely, you can see things stimming um, or these kind of rhythmic behaviors. Um, you can see oppositional behaviors. You can see, you know, the outward behaviors. But all of that is a reflection of what is going on inside of the body. Mm -hmm. And in order to really understand what's going on inside. I, I like data. I'm a data person. I want to know the data of your gut. I want to know the data of your organic acids. I want to know the data of the macronutrients in your serum or the pathogens that could be in your serum like strep. You know, I want to know it through data. So it's kind of a shift with functional medicine. Instead of always just doing the quick assessment in the model of medicine that we only have that amount of time to do it. Um, you know, actually in pediatrics, you're not encouraged to run a serum blood panel on a child unless they have fever for more than five days. So 
it's a shift. Now it is, let's get the data. Let's let the data drive our choices on how to balance the child. I love that. And um, for listeners, the Saccharomyces boulardii, like Becky referenced, uh, is that's in the Naturally Nourished Rebuild Spectrum probiotic, which is the green capsule. And like she said, Saccharomyces boulardii is such an interesting compound. You know, we usually talk so much about lactobacillus and bifida, bifidobacterium and other live active strains that have benefits for GABA and serotonin. And those could also be, I think, very appropriate for any form of neurological condition. But when we're talking about a compound that can actually have antimicrobial, antifungal, or combat pathogens, I think Saccharomyces boulardii is kind of the, the end all be all there. And I, I know you guys both mentioned, I know starting earlier than even age two, that using natural standard database and physician's reference guide, you can use compounds like caprylic acid and other compounds based on if the child has active thrush or you know yeast, and we can see wax in the ears and severe athlete's feet, and we test positive. Some forms of cleanses with natural compounds can be done, but definitely should be done under the guidance of your practitioner because at that age, you don't want to overwhelm the detoxification pathways of the child, like the liver and the kidneys, by adding too many aggressive antifungal or antiviral compounds. You know, you want to really be mindful that you're working with someone who understands kilogram or gram per kilogram, uh, milligram per kilogram dosages and can adjust appropriately for a small child. Yeah, very well said. I mean, in pediatrics, there's a saying that anybody over 84 pounds can do adult dosing. Um, but when you, we can, when it comes to the littles, uh, people that are, you know, under 84 pounds or a two-year-old or a four-year-old, you know, there's not a lot of standard guidelines to when it comes to how do we dose caprylic acid? How do we use alpha lipoic acid? What are the, you know, what is that for a child? So there is some art in dosing uh, some nutraceutical compounds. I recently um, helped write a chapter in a textbook um, on integrative medicine. It's one of the uh, books that basically train pediatric nurse practitioners all across the United States. And my, you know, chapter was on integrative and functional medicine. So I did a lot, I spent a lot of time in the literature, really digging around to, to, you know, give specific doses. And, you know, there's just not a lot of really strict guidelines. If you're X amount, then you get X amount. Um, so there is some art to it and you have to, you know, be careful and you have to, um, do things in a systematic way. So, you know, that's something is, is you got to know where to start. And it's like, you know, peeling back the layers of an onion. We want to take off the big things first and really, you know, get to the core over time. But if you overwhelm a child with too much all at once, you know, the parents are going to kind of step back and go, whoa, 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 what's going on? Because you can get a little worse before you get better. Um, so it, you got to be really systematic. Totally, especially with you know, cleanse and, and things of that nature. And we'll talk in a little bit about other supplement must-haves and, and kind of your go-tos. Um, I want to circle back real quick because I love how much space you dedicate in your book to nutrition. And there's a whole chapter, plus it's integrated within all the other chapters. So Allie and I were really, really happy to see that. Um, but what would you consider um, biggest food culprits that you feel like drive behavioral issues for kids and then maybe best foods to focus on and kind of food as medicine on the other end of the spectrum? You know, I think the biggest one is probably sugar. It's just sugar is such a big problem in our community and our world. Um, you know, even the World Health Organization has come out now and, and, and been public about how terrible sugar is for our health. So, you know, sugar isn't you giving tablespoons of sugar to your child at breakfast, you know, um, it's, it can be a cult. It can be in, you know, something that is, you know, packaged as healthy that really ends up, you know, having grams and grams and grams of high fructose corn syrup in it. So um, I think that, you know, sugar is probably the biggest thing. If we all could take out of our diet as much as possible, you're going to see some big wins with just eradication of that food alone. And then, you know, for kids on the spectrum and kids with neurodevelopmental things, you know, there is some 
opiate type peptides that come from gluten and casein. So casomorphone and glucomorphone, it's, it's known to really kind of have this addictive properties toward the brain. So, you know, getting your kids off of some of those foods can be a little bit painful for parents because they have whiny kids that are, you know, addicted to really their, you know, cheese pizza, et cetera. But, you know, they really are influencing some of the brain chemicals to be on those foods. So if I could, you know, have a blanket statement without knowing anything individual about a child, I'd say sugar, gluten, and dairy are what you should try to eradicate. And then what what do you find when working with patients are some of the best replacement? Or uh, do you typically, because again, right, when there's probably more pronounced food jags, right, more aversions, more texture concerns and and aversions, what are the best techniques in either replacing these foods or do you just promote that parents take their children into a just don't eat it, go go more of a paleo single ingredient, just just start super simple? Um, Because I find that personally, we we in our household just do single ingredient, whole food paleo. And yes, we make recipes and such, but we don't chase, you know, almond cheese or like these alternatives um, because often they're very expensive. They might not taste as good and they can, I find, frustrate a household more than support. Um, What's your kind of technique and and what feedback do you see from from patients when they're trying to remove these three foods? I think that's a really great point that you bring up because it's like, you know, do you get the cashew queso instead? And do you, you know, get the Daya cheese replacement? And, you know, it still is this processed food, right? And so the, the, one of the sayings that um, a nutritionist actually in, in Austin, her name's Carly Pollock. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she says, you know, you, you love foods, you eat, you're supposed to eat foods that rot and spoil. Um, so when, when we look at, you know, a gold fish, you know, straight out of the ocean versus a packaged gold fish, you know, what is going to rot and spoil? Well, the, the live food, the live animal, um, you know, what's going to happen to banana chips versus a regular banana on the, you know, that's going to brown on your, on your shelf over time. So I always like to just encourage parents, we're taking these out, but look at all these other foods that you're not eating that are beautiful and wonderful and come from the earth, um, that are whole live food ingredients. So it's just a shift in the value of what are we thinking that our body needs to what our body truly, truly needs and wants. So, you know, it comes down to that picky eating kit. Like, how am I going to make this change? They're super addicted to their, you know, Ritz crackers and their, um, you know, name anything process. They're addicted to it. So, to me, you know, my, my partner has a different approach to this. She likes to just kind of replace one food at a time and do that over time. I'm kind of an, uh, I'm, I'm a rip off the bandaid type of girl. So, you know, it is, it is literally, this is what's good for our body. This is what is not good for our body. I'm, I'm doing this because I love you. We're going to just go into the pantry and we're going to clean out all the crap and I'm going to buy real food. And You know, when you sit down at the table and you've prepared something that's wonderful for your child that they know that they can eat and tolerate, you know, not to mention other like nut allergies, et cetera, if they don't eat it and you're in this transition phase of trying to get your kids to eat, um, I say, well, I guess you're not hungry. Let them get down, play, do their thing, but they don't get to try again until the next scheduled meal or snack time. Right. And then you try again. And after all of the years that I've been doing this, I haven't had one kid go more than one day without eating. So eventually they'll eat. When you're hungry enough, you'll eat. I mean, we've all seen those, well, maybe not all of us, but I mean, they're fascinating, those naked and afraid shows where literally they're going to eat anything after a couple of days. They're eating slugs and they're the most delicious thing they've ever eaten. You know, when our bodies are hungry and we have a nourishing meal in front of our child, they are going to eat. They are going to pick up that food and eat. They're smarter than we give them um, 
credit for because our kids manipulate us very, very, very early on for what they want. You know, it's the toddler that's nine months old that's throwing, um, you know, her broccoli on the floor, right? She's wanting you um, to replace it with something that she wants, right? Our kids are so smart so, so early on, and they know if they hold on long enough, they're going to get what they want. So it's a mind shift for the parent to say, you know, my kid can't get in his car and go to the grocery store and shop for himself or go through the drive through because there will be a day where all of our kids are going to be able to do that. So when they're young, we have the power. We are not responsible for what they eat. We are responsible for what we provide them to eat. And we have to remember that when they're refusing to eat or when you're going through this transition time. I love that. And I think that echoes back to a couple of episodes we've done on toddler nutrition and, you know, yes. providing the choices and Autonomy. structure. Yeah, exactly. Autonomy and education. I think yep. we take for granted that our children, I totally agree, Dr. Gutierrez, our children are so smart. Um, Stella recently, I have to brag on this, uh, when Becky was over last uh, for some team building events and such, she was eating a grass fed steak and broccoli and something else. And um, she's like, okay. Uh, I think she said more raspberries or more blueberries, please. And I was like, all right. And then I was like, how about you have another bite of your steak? And she goes, right, for the protein mama. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, girl. It's just so funny because when we talk to Stella, we say, choose your protein. Do you want salmon? Or do you know, so we give choices, but we educate her on what each component of her plate is so that she has that information. And when she's on her own, she'll say, hey, I don't have a protein <laughs> and hopefully, you know, that resonates and that helps her when she's making her decisions at the cafeteria in five years from now. And that, that really sits strong with her. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I love it that you're giving her that definition. So early on that vocabulary to work from, that's very smart. So funny because I feel like we re-educate adults on that all the time. Like, no, put your protein <laughs> on your plate first. Like Stella's got it down. <laughs> um, what would you say, Dr. Gutierrez, would be best foods um, to focus on? Kind of like food as medicine goals, if you will, to implement and, and focus on replacement with. So what are the big players to make sure get on that plate at least like once a day or a couple times a week? Oh gosh, I'm glad you asked that question because, you know, protein, as you guys both talked about, is incredibly important. But man, fat for a child is really, really important, especially for their brain. You know, half of our brain and dry weight is just fat. And it's not, you know, the fat on the outside of their chicken nugget that we're looking for. It's the fat that is, you know, full of omega-3 fatty acids. It's full of, uh, you know, alpha-linoleic acid. It's full of the good healthy fats that really help us to have, you know, a way to mitigate inflammation even in our bodies. So I have run a lot of cholesterol panels on my kiddos and not because I'm looking for hyperlipidemia or, you know, problems with atherosclerosis, I literally see cholesterol levels in the 90s because kids are just so fat deficient. Um, it's important, important, important that everything that we do with our kids that we make it count with, you know, having something that has a healthy fat in it. So, you know, it helps with satiety. It helps with that, you know, hangry up and down. And it helps, you know, layer every single cell in our body has this phospholipid fat layer that's needed for signaling of molecules that come into the cell and help, you know, orchestrate everything that's supposed to go into the cell and then come out of the cell. So fat is probably my number one for any child, a good sense of healthy fat. Fats that come from nuts, seeds, avocados, you know, some of my favorite oils are avocado oil, algae oil, olive oil, if it's, um, of course, not cooked at a high temperature. Um, sesame oil can be okay. Uh, so I think that, you know, we just have to really, really be mindful of where are our kids getting fat. So that couldn't transition us any better into today's <laughs> sponsor of episode 138 of the Naturally Nourished Podcast, F-Bomb. So you teed it up. <laughs> Let's yes, get into it. Fat Bombs uh, or F-Bomb as a company started off providing nut butters and they are definitely a fantastic go-to snack for kids. They provide just over 200 calories and 20 grams of fat 
per pack. They also have options of premium oils. They have a MCT oil for brain boost. They have a coconut oil and olive oil pack so that you don't have to navigate the industrialized oils in your standard salad dressings when dining out. Yes. And I love their nut butter packs and their MCT oil for when I'm traveling and on the go, I can blend the MCT into a fatty coffee um, and drizzle the extra onto like a salad or half an avocado. Um, Their olive oil is also amazing as is their avocado oil. Yes. And so the F-bomb packs, all the members of the Miller household drop an (laughs) F-bomb very regularly. (laughs) And uh, Brady keeps the box by his bed. Uh, Now, Brady, who doesn't do the ketogenic diet, he has a trick where he takes half a banana or a whole banana, sometimes I'll call him out, um, and he uses the macadamia coconut, uh, which has only three ingredients. That's what I love about the F-bomb packs. Stella doesn't do any packaged products, exception of F-bombs, because it's all real whole food ingredients, ingredients you can pronounce, understand, and see. So for instance, when Brady does the coconut macadamia, it's coconut, roasted macadamia nuts, and salt. And he will put one of those packs on his banana, and at least that blunts that glycemic impact on his body, and um, is a great evening treat for sure, because banana does help with serotonin with that tryptophan, so I'm sure he gets into a deep blissful sleep state. And for me, I just take an F-bomb straight. Um, I love the pecan. Uh, The pecan macadamia is my favorite go-to. I think that it tastes like pie crust because I don't do any non-caloric sweeteners. And so that like savory of the raw pecans, roasted macadamia and salt has a fabulous mouthfeel, a nice uh, little crunch to it. And Miss Stella can't get enough. We do an F-bomb pretty much daily. I love keeping them on hand for if I'm running errands. If she's getting a blood sugar drop, that is a saving grace for toddlers. So I'm all about feeding our kids ample fat. And F-bomb is a great way to deliver a punch of nutrient density with single clean ingredients. Yes. And down the pipeline, they've got some new stuff coming. Their keto crunch is a really yummy. If you are doing dairy, um, cheese, crunchy snack. And then they also have some, um, pork sticks coming down the line sometime soon. Yes. And you can use the code Allie Miller RD at checkout to save 20%, or you can go over to drop an F bomb backslash Allie Miller RD, and you can put in your first order and you will save 20% or 10% off if you've already ordered through F bomb. So go check them out. All right. So thanks for the tea up, Dr. Gutierrez. That couldn't have been more perfect. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> what a wonderful convenient thing to be able to do. I didn't, I, I hadn't, um, I don't know a lot about f bomb, so I'm going to have to check those out for sure. Yeah, they're totally on the rise. They're now at like Vitamin Shop and uh, they're expanding to a bunch of different grocers, but they're definitely available all over online too. Yeah, H-E-B has them here in Houston, at least I'm sure Central Market in Austin will. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wonderful. Your parents are always wondering where, where, what, what sources of fat are you talking about? Where can I get a fat? So um, that's wonderful to know. Yes. Uh, so just moving forward for diet before we go into kind of like rapid fire mode with you, uh, there was a question. I was on a panel uh, a couple weeks ago at Paleo FX. Um, it was called like raising your Neanderthals, <laughs> something about paleo parenting or something. And um, one of the questions that I'm sure you deal with a lot in clinic is what happens when the other parent in the household isn't on board? Uh, what techniques <laughs> and recommendations do you have? Cause my answer was I'm the boss. <laughs> so that wasn't very helpful. I'm sure for people in the audience, uh, Brady really buys in to me as the nutrition guru. Now Brady wins with other things and I give him grace with parenting techniques. But when it comes to what Stella's eating, you know, I kind of just smile and say, okay, well, let's talk the science. And he has a little bit of FOMO as a parent, um, you know, worrying about, well, Stel- like today's Stella's lunch was uh, but cut up bell pepper, cucumber, raspberries, an almond butter uh, pancake that I had made yesterday. And uh, she must have had something else in there. I don't recall, maybe some olives or something. Um, but he's always like, what, where's her crunchy snack? Where's her, uh, like, he's worried. He's, he's placing his personal. <laughs> oh, Allie, you it know? is always hard to be a prophet in your own country. Yes. It is. <laughs> no, you just keep doing what you know is right. And, and that's the thing is, you know, I, I've dealt with skepticism from the first degree in my own health. You know, the first time I, I went to 
a big conference called Applying Functional Medicine and Clinical Practice. It's like a week long training from the IFM. Yep. And I came back and I mean, I went into our pantry and I was like a, you know, a tornado just pulling out everything that was bad. And my husband was like, what are you doing? This is insanity. And I'm like, no, this is how it's going to be from now on. You know, we are what we eat, you know, energy in versus energy out. We can't eat like this anymore. And, you know, weaning him off of monsters it, you know, it took a long time in my house. Um, but finally, you know, he goes to the grocery store and I don't throw away anything he buys anymore. I used to, but I don't anymore. So I think that skepticism when it comes to parents, if one parent is on board, but the other isn't, we have to honor that their skepticism. Part of that is healthy. You know, we don't want to just jump on the bandwagon for the next health craze. We want to understand, is there science in this? Is there validity in this? Is this really what is best? So bring on the skeptical parents. I think that part of that is healthy and it creates a good healthy balance between different parents. When you have a child on the spectrum, you're going to be inundated with, oh, well, now I'm doing this therapy and I'm doing this new technique and this new supplement's working and I'm trying this and that. And you can't just jump into everything all at once. You know, you're going to end up exhausted and, and disenchanted by the whole process. So when you have this balance of one, one parent isn't on board and the other is all in, I think it's, it's, it's a healthy balance. And in the end, you know, we'll have to say, is what we're doing safe? Well, yes, it is. So can we give it some time and then see the outcome of the child? Are they sleeping better? Are they gaining weight? Are they stimming less? Is their mood more stable? And the proof will be in the pudding. Give it a good amount of time and it doesn't happen overnight. It's not an Advil, right? We don't take, you know, uh, we don't eat a bell pepper and then within 60 minutes our headache's gone. That's not how nutritional really work, you know, nutrition and functional medicine work. We have to give it time to let the body rebalance. So when you've given it adequate time, most of my therapies I say at least six weeks, but really up until the three month mark, you make an assessment then. And if what you're doing is working, then you have buy-in from the other parent. So, you know, you can um, then go forth with, you know, different therapies and, and everybody is, you know, on board. So it's kind of my strategy in coaching parents and um, around how to, how to deal with that situation, which is a very common thing to deal with. Sure. And I think in the beginning, like you said, it, it can be such a dynamic pantry overhaul and transition. And then there's that dynamic I always get from parents. Well, do my other children have to eat this way? And even, even beyond ADHD and autism, let's talk, you know, Crohn's disease or, or whatever chronic mm -hmm. illness we're working with a specific diet for a child. I, I really encourage that the whole household buys in. Uh, we obviously don't want to create isolation and other behavioral concerns or wonderful you know, the, the victim mentality to start to develop very young in the child of watching other siblings doing things. And it's just this, this redefining your relationship with food, a continual process. And when you're starting in the muck, you can't see the light. <laughs> when you're yeah. feeling like garbage, when you're not getting neuropathway optimization, it's very difficult to see that, that one plus two equals three. But mm -hmm. as you start to remove, I often see patients and parents of patients that will say, that aha moment of, you know, she went to grandma and grandpa's and she yes. had donuts at church on Sunday or whatever it is, you know, and she came back and she would, she had her, her tremors again, or she had X, Y, Z, or this, this was a downslide. And not that that's a positive to see negative feedback, but th that connects some of the ahas. And it's, it's all a learning process of the connection of food as information and impact on the developing child. Well, yes, and it tells us a story. Yes. So I, I love it when um, my patients will be, you know, in remission or doing really well. And then all of a sudden, you know, they just feel so great that they slide back in. Um, can you guys hear me? Uh huh. Okay, sorry, I thought I pressed mute, sorry. They slide back into old habits. You know, they, they start getting gluten a little bit in their diet or they stop taking their omegas or, you know, they don't, um, you know, they don't meditate as much or they aren't as mindful with therapies, et cetera. And then they start to have the chronic symptoms come back in. Like, for example, I see a, 
um, a very beautiful young adult woman that um, has, you know, I started seeing her in high school and she has rheumatoid arthritis and her joints when I saw her were just hot and swollen and she, you know, was on biologics for her, um, her arthritis, which is like a medicine that is an infusion that you get and, and nothing was touching her. Well, we balanced her gut. We took her off of some of the foods that she was allergic to. We put her on some great things like high dose omegas and curcuminoids and vitamin Ds. And she was doing great. Well, she went off to college and two years in, um, my last follow up with her, it was all of her joint inflammation was back. And in fact, it was in her knees and she'd had gone and had steroid injections. And you know, her parents were extremely worried. Well, um, it turns out, you know, she just dropped off on everything. She was drinking more with her sorority. She couldn't afford the supplements, so she wasn't taking them, or she wasn't asking her parents to help her out with that, you know, eating a lot of fast food. And she was just right back in the place where she started. So when I followed up with her, I said, this just tells us a beautiful story. Look right. at how much control you do have over this chronic illness when you are able to take care of yourself in a way that is meaningful for you. So failure is, is an opportunity for growth. I love that. That's so awesome. Um, so going back to supplement strategy real quick, um, let's talk about just kind of rapid fire. What would you say for foundational health, kind of your top three non-negotiable supplements? And I'd love to hear dosage and, and form if you've got it off the top of your head as well. Sure. So for in Becky, for what 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 type of child Just are we optimal talking? let's say like a so mo, let's say for listening moms like optimal they have a toddler and they just are wondering you know do they need anything beyond a multi oh gosh probably the answer to that is yes especially if that toddler has any constipation if there's constipation involved at all um we probably need a little bit of magnesium but like the three foundational things I think most everyone should be really taking is an, a good essential fatty acid, um, a good methylated B vitamin, um, even in the littles, especially in some of those with you know anything neurodevelopmental, um, magnesium if there's any problems with sleep or bowel motility, um, and then you know probiotics. I, I'm on the fence of everybody all the time should be taking a probiotic. Certainly if you were born via C-section or if you, you know, after being born, you were bottle fed, we want to really introduce good microbes very, very early on in life when the microbiome is really colonizing and it's setting the stage for your life. Um, I think that probiotics can be really important during that phase. But for a three-year-old that eats a great diversity of food and plants and fermented things and has regular bowel movements and is, you know, typically, um, you know, developing, I think probiotics come into, if you ever have to do antibiotics, that's a really important time to do probiotics. But, you know, every day, I'm, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure everybody needs it every day. I mean, you know, Ali, I saw that you're running that 55 SNP report from GX Sciences. It's one of the labs that you guys do. Mm -hmm. We run that as well. And, you know, I think that if you have one of those genetic mutations called the fugal transferase, yes. where basically there's a, there's a genetic SNP where if you're not basically feeding your gut microbes from your blood sugars as, as, as well, I think some of those patients really benefit from a daily probiotic. So a methylated vitamin, a good essential fatty acid, a probiotic in some cases, and magnesium is so huge for so many people. Um, I think those are some of the basics. And do you typically prefer a magnesium bisglycinate for more of the neuromuscular function and then just like a mag citrate to pulse for constipation or what's your go-to there? Yeah, you know, I like I like med citrate for for constipation. Um, however, you know, it it's it's definitely better than some of the um, things out there that have polyethylene glycol in them yes. um, for constipation. So I think it can work really well. But you know, for like sleep and for um, neurodevelopmental things, I like uh, glycinate is actually um, a good one or magnesium threonate. I like that one a lot. Um, and anything from dosing it from 
you know, depending on the size of the child, if from 250 milligrams up to even two grams. So it depends on the weight and the age of the child. So it's a little bit hard for me to give dosing on that. Sure. You know, Sid Baker is one of, I don't know if you guys have ever listened to any lectures from Sid Baker, but he's one of the uh, physicians. He's a Yale guy and he's one of the developmental kind of functional medicine pediatric gurus. And I think he's one of the founders. So he's even Mark Hyman's, one of Mark Hyman's mentors. Okay. Um, and he talks, you know, I was, I had a two hour lecture from him about magnesium and, you know, we cannot really overdo it on magnesium. Yeah. Yep. in most people. So have you guys ever seen too much magnesium and this hyper magnesium kind of theor theoretical thing? Have you guys ever seen oh, it? the bisglycinate, and that's what we no. predominantly use. You know, obviously, because it's <laughs> <That's> the worst. <laughs> right. Meg citrate is osmotic, so bowel tolerance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's kind of yeah. just like vitamin C. <laughs> what we usually say for vitamin C during immune system, it's like dose your child to bowel tolerance. Uh, yeah you know, and their immune system will use what they need. And when you're getting the osmotic feedback, you're, you're, you're likely at a threshold. So then back off a little bit. <laughs> yes. Good. And I, you know, one, one I should mention a lot too is, is vitamin D. So most of us need vitamin D. And in fact, I take vitamin D at 10,000 units every day and I never get toxic on it. My levels stay around 80. Um, there are different genetic SNPs, as you know, your vitamin D receptor SNPs that a lot of people, you cannot go out in the sunshine enough or naked enough for enough time at the right latitude at the right time of year to get a really optimized level of vitamin D. So especially in infancy, you need to replete vitamin D. Um, in infancy, even the American Academy of Pediatrics supports vitamin D supplementation. Um, so that's a big one for a lot of people. And Anybody that ever gets labs done, I think you should check a vitamin D level. Just see where you're at. And the spectrum, you know, for lab ranges is somewhere from 20 to 100. And because we know vitamin D is not really a vitamin, but a hormone that does so many beautiful, wonderful things, I like to optimize my patient in that range, you know, closer to 100 versus, you know, maybe a, another provider saying, well, you're at 21, so you don't need vitamin yeah. D. 32 is normal, <laughs> like not optimal <laughs> <No>. though. <laughs> yes, right. So I think that goes to our next kind of rapid fire and, and maybe you can advise on like pulsing up with children. So the top three go to for immune support. So let's say that, you know, again, maybe the child's five, six, seven, somewhere kind of in that world. And you get a note from school that there's a bunch of gunk going around and your kiddo has a stuffy nose, sore throat, some form of, you know, ENT distress, maybe a, a low grade fever. What are your three things, Dr. Gutierrez, that you're going to pump your child with to support their immune system? Would you up their daily vitamin D? Would you bring in C? What, what else? What things are you bringing, bringing in? So if there's a kid that's let's say six, and he comes in with URI symptoms or upper respiratory symptoms, you know, I might say, let's go to 50,000 units of vitamin D for the next three days. And then I would put that kiddo on 600 milligrams twice a day of N-acetylcysteine or even 900 tw twice a day. There's really only one effervescent liquid N-acetylcysteine that I know of on the market that we use sometimes called Pharmanac. Um, and acetylcysteine is a mucolytic, so it works great on just thinning out the mucous membranes or the mucus secretions, so basically you can expectorate them better. Um, it's a great antioxidant to have on board when there's an upper respiratory symptom. And then there's so many different antiviral herbs. So, you know, elderberry is well known for the flu. You know, it is well studied in the flu. Um, another herb that works really, really well is Andrographis pollicula. Um, that is actually better than um, elderberry for the flu. But, you know, some type of combination that's with echinacea and elderberry, um, there's lots of different products out there that, that parents can get. I think that you can, you know, very safely give, you know, two to three times what the label says that you can give up to two times a day when your kiddo is sick. So that and then vitamin C, you're never going to go wrong with doing a lot of vitamin C. You know, I would caution that a lot of vitamin C typically comes with a lot of sugar though. Yeah. So, and the vitamin C's that don't have a lot of sugar in them, they don't taste that great. Buffered, chalky, <laughs> which are yeah. the superior. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
or there's one by Quicksilver that's a liposomal vitamin C, and boy, that is that is just not very tasty. But like right. salty. Oh yeah, it gets you in your cheek. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but those can be very effective too when you're when you're when you have an onset. Um, so there's a lot of tools in the toolbox for different immune supplements, but I guess the three really big ones is really pumping up the vitamin D, um, and doing it short term and putting on N acetylcysteine, um, and doing vitamin C, those three things you're not going to, um, you're going to see benefit from. And then for, you know, a layer in, you could always do some of those, those herbal remedies. I love that. And one thing you talked to me about proactively, which was so great, and Stella's still working on it, is teaching your children early, like in the bathtub, to blow out because it's so common nature that children, you know, suck in their phlegm and their mucus and that mm-hmm. drives more infection, more stagnation versus teaching them to, to blow out, to ex- um, so if you're working with expectorants, you know, the knack is also very high um, in bone broth. So uh, using bone broth to like cook down vegetables or trying to get your children at an early age to sip bone broth, I think is also very supportive, not only for gut, but we think of that as an immune boost because of the knack, the N-acetylcysteine and the salty liquid, I think also aids with that expectorant to break up that density in the chest. But that's a huge behavioral thing, Dr. Gutierrez, that I always share with friends is like, teach them to blow out, go to the bubble bath and teach them, or we will work with like a feather. Um, and, and Stella knows how to like breathe out when we work with breath to like relax. <laughs> That's awesome. all we do. She likes to see the feather move forward, you know? Um, and now we're working with plugging one nostril and blowing the feather with the nose. And she's just starting to, it's funny. She goes, honk. <laughs> she like makes a noise, but doesn't. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> it's pretty well, funny. <laughs> I mean, this, it's not rocket science, you know, because when you get an ear infection, it's that eustachian tube is connected from the back of your nose to the middle of your ear. Yeah. So if you have snot or mucus, which is an immune system defense response, and it's good that we have it. But if you have an accumulation of it and you're not really, you know, getting it out, the, the kids are just going to suck up that snot into their middle ear and that is what an ear infection is. Um, and you know, if your pediatrician looks in that little, you know, at the tympanic membrane and it's red and bulging and hot and they have fever, they're going to immediately want to go to an antibiotic. So what we need to do is teach our kids to blow their nose, but also, you know, I really find some value in, in, uh, xylitol as well. You can do some xylitol nose spray. Xylitol is antimicrobial and it it can loosen some things up in there as well. And if your kids, parents, if they cannot blow their nose, you have to blow it for them. Mm -hmm. So you have to use that nose Frida I love that one or the bulb syringe. You got to get it out or you're going to get an ear infection. We uh, freaked out Becky's husband. He saw it on the counter and he's like, what is that booger sucker thing? Tell me I don't have to do that, Becky, in the future. Oh my God. Oh, we yes. don't have kids yet. So he doesn't even know what's, what's going to hit him. Oh yeah. <laughs> but you will have to know how to use that nose. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And before we move on to uh, one, a couple last questions, uh, I just want to ask about essential oils and like, um, uh, you know, different vaporizers in the bedroom. Is that something you recommend for that kind of stuffy nose, throat gunk time as well? Sure. I think that some of the bigger brands have a great, you know, herbal blends. They have different herbal blends, um, depending on if you're using Young Living, et cetera. I think diffusing those can be very helpful. Um, you know, I, I don't know a ton about essential oils. I know that And they can be very safe and certainly they're way safer to diffuse in your house than like lighting a candle. Mm -hmm. Um, So, and I mean, I use essential oils for deodorant. I don't use any kind of aluminum, you know, chemical based deodorant. So I think they can be really wonderful. Um, When your kid has strep throat, I don't think you should use essential oils. You know, I think that strep throat needs to be treated, right? So I think there is this spectrum of people that everything essential oils and nothing medicinal you know, pharmaceuticals. And I think there's a space for essential oils for sure, but let's not, um, you know, don't go overboard and let your kid be sick for too long if they're not recovering on their own. Sure. I think that totally makes sense. And it's, it's good to hear you can kind of hit the, um, allopathic when you need it <laughs> yes. or, you know, severe infections or a broken bone and all of those things. And, and, um, there are these tools to have in your tool belt, kind of proactively as they start getting sick and start coming up with some 
skunk so it doesn't progress. Um, what about behavior go-tos in terms of supplementation? So like anxiety, outrage, sleep, you mentioned the magnesium, but what are your go-tos for behavior? Mm. So behavior is a, a really big one. Um, I think magnesium can work extremely well for behavior um, as far as someone that has anxiety. Also, L-theanine can be helpful for anxiety. Um, Pharmagaba can be helpful for anxiety. Um, you know, also kids that are often having a lot of um, OCD or um, oppositional behaviors. So actually high dose in acetylcysteine is really great for some OCD type behaviors. Um, also, if there's some oppositional behaviors, I like a little bit of lithium orotate. And really, let's let, we have to always go back to our kids and look at what, what is their methylation? You know, what is their B vitamin support? And in kids, not only do they need, you know, methylated folate, a lot of them, which is one of the precursors to serotonin and dopamine, but we also need a good amount of, you know, methylated B12 and pyridoxine 5-phosphate or B6. And, you know, in kids with neurodevelopmental things, a lot of them have a very high need for folinic acid, which is kind of that one step before the methyl um, folate. So with mood and behavior, you know, just supplements alone, I really think about, okay, what is their methylation support needs? What is their macronutrient like their magnesium needs? Um, and then are there some other herbal calming things like the L-theanine and the GABA? I love all of those things. And I, I find GABA to be a pretty dynamic, like light switch uh, response because that does impact. And there's, we've talked past episodes, we don't need to go into the mechanisms of, you know, working with enteric system versus blood brain barrier and yada, yada. But I, I find that that's one of the easy when we're making change because it can also help with um, like addictive tendencies and, um, What's the word I'm looking for, Becky? I want to say urgency, but it's impulse control. Impulse, yeah. Mm -hmm. Impulse control. So when you're working with diet shift, I think that that can be a very helpful tool or like transitioning your child, ugh, which we have to talk about screen time and video games before we let you go. <laughs> but I was going to say, I work with a couple parents that have children that are addicted to video games. And you know, my answer is just don't give them access to it. But um, in that transition time of like, okay, whatever their behavior is, you have five minutes left or whatever the countdown is, that's when then the parent will give the GABA because otherwise there is that severe addiction um, where there's like physical violence that I'm seeing in, in children um, when the screen time is being pulled away. And I think that that connects a lot to the dopamine impact of blue light, you know, driving dopamine expression. And then especially if it's a video game and there's some competitive edge or that additional feedback that we're getting more dopamine influence. Um, what's your perspective on screen time? And uh, I know new guidelines just came out uh, as of recent in, in uh, pediatrics. Let's just talk a little bit about that and how you approach that in, in today's modern environment. <laughs> Oh man, I just, I really, Allie, I don't know if we have any idea what we're up against in the future with our kids and, you know, and let's not forget ourselves as adults too, with being on the screen for, you know, our work and being on the screen at stop signs. And, you know, you, I think adults get just as much screen times as kids really, um, a lot of times because it's oh. involved in our work, et cetera. Um, I think a lot of the things that you just talked about were the need for more dopamine on our brain, the, you know, the prefrontal executive functioning with um, impulse control, organization, planning, memory, those are all dopaminergic functions. And, you know, when I, especially with addiction, I think a lot about dopamine. So can somebody, you know, can they build dopamine? Well, then can they access dopamine? So one of the things that I like for, you know, accessing dopamine is s methionine. That amino acid can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, with screen... SAM, SAM e for listeners. Yeah, SAM e So the, the, the thing that worries me the most now, I think about a lot of screen time, is just that photonic energy we're getting from the blue light. Mm -hmm. You know, blue light is, is very... Um, the photons are really electrically charged, way more than the red light is. So, um, you know, too much 
photonic blue light energy into our into our eyes, our cornea, our retina over time um, can cause um, basically a degradation of our um, of, of the structures of our, of our structures in our eyes. So it's like kind of a wow. ripping apart that can happen over time. So that's why a lot of people are now, I mean, on your, you know, Mac products or your other products, you know, your screen products, a lot of them have a shift where you can put on night shift. And instead of having a, a blue screen, you can have a yellow screen. So I think that when we can be mindful and make choices like that about actually, you know, okay, we, if we allow our children to have screen time, you know, what is their screen like? Can we mitigate any of the, you know, potential side effects that we can see for this high photonic energy from the blue light? Um, and then just knowing that, you know, don't watch life, you have to live life. So, right. you know, that it's going to be a struggle. I don't have the answer for it. It's going to be a struggle from every child. I've seen a parent in my office hand their nine-month-old their phone and seen a nine month old navigate through their phone to get to um, a video. I mean, it's incredible. So it's from the very, very beginning of life now. And I don't, I don't know what the answer is. I limited as much as you possibly can. Um, tell your kids to go out and live life and not watch life. Um, mitigate the side, side effects of the blue light as much as you can um, and model that for your children, you know? Because you can be on your computer working and uh, screaming at your kid to get off of the, you know, video games or YouTube or whatever, and they're watching you. You're doing it too. So they need to see you outside running around in the yard and gardening and meditating and swimming and exercising. They need to see that and involve them in things like that. My, my 12-year-old now will, you know, we'll go outside and meditate together. My even 16-year-old meditated with me the other day. Like, I'm really trying to just, you know, it's just a constant struggle every day. I, I wish I had a, a, a candid one-line answer for you. You do. I wrote it down. Live life. Don't watch life. <laughs> she found it. <laughs> Becky's good at that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, one of my concerns is also the, like, personal tablets and EMF. Um, so I'll often, ugh, like yesterday, we do half a Daniel, half a Daniel Tiger <laughs> is our like evening thing. And I do, I think that there are quality programs that are educational and peer influential and things that do empower children and can help, you know, especially like, I think Daniel Tiger has a lot of great lessons. We practice a lot of their songs in our household, actually, you know, like the take a deep breath stuff and what have you. And even the try new foods because it might taste good song and all those things. Um, and, and that's an okay ritual, but I, I try to do like planet earth or something that's educational on the screen of our household. If we're doing screen time and try as much as I can to avoid the, the cell phone thing for kids. Cause I really worry when I see kids with it on their abdomen over their sexual glands, you know, I'm like, what is going to occur <laughs> with two year olds that are holding a cell phone on their ovaries? Um, and, and over the years, I don't know, and that might just be a weird freakish thing in my mind, but I feel like there's probably some impact that EMF is going to have from that level of radiation if we're constantly putting these devices on our children's bodies in the strollers and so forth. So I have a little bit of a pet peeve with that too. Mm -hmm. I agree. And it's, it's not a one-time exposure, no, you know, no. it's a continual exposure. Right. And there is, you know, my dad's a nuclear physicist and we were actually talking about binary fission and, and photons and e everything yeah. yesterday. And I mean, there's a whole new world out there that we can't see. We can't, you know, unless you're a physicist or a scientist, you really don't understand all the magnitude of everything that is happening. So I, I just, Ali, I don't think we know yet. Yeah. I don't think we know. But what I think is worrisome is the continual exposure from the really the first moments of life mm -hmm. that our kids are getting. We don't know. There's no longitudinal data that we can pull from. We don't know. Yeah. So, you know, I think trying to balance it as best as we can is, is the thing that we can do as parents. Yeah, and I like that balance of getting outside, grounding, meditating, getting that parasympathetic reset, 
uh, from this chronic sympathetic stimulant environment that we all live in and that, like you said, adults, parents are, are living in. And so we all need that, <laughs> that pendulum swing back to mellow. Um, and I think that that might be, you know, now we see like anything, once we identify a problem, we try to outscience the problem versus just remove the problem. Um, so I, I'm a big proponent of infrared sauna and red light phototherapy and things like that. Mm -hmm. But root cause, get back to nature, remove the device. And, and I'd always prefer to go more there. Mm -hmm. I love that. Get back to nature. I mean, nature provides a lot of answers for us, a That's lot right. of answers. So. so we could pick your brain all day on all of the things, but let's tell <laughs> listeners um, where they can find more out about you and your practice. Sure. So we are at neuronutritionassociates.com and there, you know, you can find out about our practice. We have a um, online store now that has actually some educational modules that parents can go through. Um, if you have a kid on the spectrum or if you have a kid with ADHD and, you know, their biggest thing is, you know, they're constantly sick. I have a module on, you know, the immune system and, and you know, kids with developmental, developmental issues. Um, so we have some modules, we have labs online, just like you guys sell, we're starting to sell some labs online for parents that don't have access, say they live in, you know, New Jersey, or they live across state, and they can't come in and see us. So, you know, once you get to our website, you can read about us. And then I, you know, we created these other things. So hopefully parents can kind of get in, involved and do some of the care on their own, especially if they don't have access to a provider like you guys. Um, or they're not able to physically come in and see somebody. That's the problem, I believe, with functional medicine at this point in our history is that it's not mainstream enough, and access to care can be really tough for sure. families. Um, so, and then our book, our book's on Amazon um, at the, you know, you just Google uh, the Parents Roadmap to Autism, a functional medicine approach, and you'll find us there. Awesome. And it's a fantastic resource. I highly recommend it. We'll put a link, of course, to your website and the book in our show notes. And for those of you guys listening live-ish at the end of May, we are going to be doing a giveaway with Dr. Gutierrez's book, the, pa the Parents' Roadmap to Autism, a Functional Medicine Approach. So be sure to tune in on Instagram and we'll be doing a giveaway the week of the episode air. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We have to ask you one final question that we ask all of our guests, and this one might trip you up the most because it's a memory game. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as dietitians, uh, Becky and I always ask our guests, what did you eat yesterday? <laughs> so it's a 24-hour recall. Um, so yesterday Aww. was Sunday, if that helps. I know I always have to kind of like frame it. Um, so just kind of from rise to rest, what did you eat yesterday? Oh, that's a very interesting question. So I traveled back from uh, Santa Fe to Austin yesterday. So it was a travel day in the airport. Um, so woke up and I had leftovers that we had made, which was um, some heirloom tomatoes with a little bit of mozzarella and balsamic. I had that for breakfast. I had um, two handfuls of pistachios as a, a snack because then we were going to hit my favorite restaurant in Santa Fe, which is Harry's Roadhouse, before we hit the airport in um, Albuquerque. And uh, for dinner, this was the last thing I ate yesterday, I had, um, it was Christmas, so red chili and green chili, blue corn, turkey, and gelatas um, that had a side of pinto beans, but I didn't eat those, and they had some lettuce and tomato on them. So that's what I ate. Oh, and I had three cups of coffee and lots and lots of water. <laughs> so awesome. It sounds sounds like, like a pretty good travel day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. The travel day, the extra cup of coffee came um, when the late flight was delayed and I was going to get in later. So, um, <laughs> you know, I try to really limit my caffeine to the morning time. But yesterday, that's my one vice is caffeine. I just really love my caffeine. So. <laughs> We all got to have one. We all got to have one. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Gutierrez. We will send all of our listeners all of the links so that they can find you, learn more about you, and start to engage in what wonderful work you do. Thank you for joining us today. It has been a, such a fun conversation and hope to have another one in the future. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been fun.
Thank you for listening to the Naturally Nourished podcast. Visit our blog at AllieMillerRD.com for recipes, wellness tips, and food as medicine meal plans. Connect with Allie and Becky at AllieMillerRD on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, stay nourished and be well.